Hi, and welcome back to the seventh day ox. Let's jump right in, see where we're at, and what is going to happen. We are on chapter 14. The weekend passed, and Monday came and went. By now, the thought of food had almost gone from Nikolai's mind. He had not eaten in nine whole days. It was as if his body had slipped into another world that no longer required him to eat. Of course, he was getting weaker every day, but being in the box didn't require much movement, so it also required very little energy. However, there was a dull, throbbing pain in his legs, and that scared Nikolai more than anything. During the first few days in the box, the pain had been pretty bad whenever he moved his legs. Now he couldn't even move them of their own accord. It was as if they were logs of wood attached to his body at the hips. He didn't really feel them much anymore. He worked on them all the time, using his arms to move them every day, many times a day. By Tuesday of the second week, the box smelled rank beyond description, and the flies were everywhere. It was a living nightmare. Nikolai no longer worried about the warden. He no longer worried about food or water. He just prayed that God would give him the strength to make it through another day. Around noon on the tenth day, Nikolai heard footsteps. He peered through the slats and saw the warden standing in the doorway. Yuri, the barrack guard, was with him. Open the box, the warden said. That was all. It was as if there was there were a merely a mere formality in the life and duties of a warden at the prison camp. To Nikolai, it had been the worst experience of his life. Yuri opened the lid of the box. Oh my, he sputtered as he held his hand over his mouth. You smell putrid. Get out of the box, he ordered, shaking his hand in disgust. You're free to go. But Nikolai couldn't stand. Yuri reached down and lifted Nikolai out of the box. When he saw that Nikolai couldn't walk, his face grew serious, and a look of compassion filled his eyes. He helped Nikolai to a bed of straw and let him lay down. I'll be all right, Nikolai assured him with a weak smile. Right now, he just wanted to be alone so that he could scream out in pain if needed to, if he needed to. For 10 days, he hadn't been able to move his legs properly, and now the pain of moving them was almost as excruciating as having his legs cramped up in the box. All the rest of that day, Nikolai lay on the straw, trying to gain his strength and flex his legs so that he could walk on them. Yuri brought him a tin plate of borscht at the supper hour, and Nikolai managed to eat a few bites. He wasn't foolish enough to eat at all. After being deprived of food for so long, he knew his stomach would never be able to handle that much food. Before dusk, Oleg and Maxim came in from their long day of hauling water. Once again, Nikolai felt a sense of kinship with the ox and was glad for his company. As the night settled in, Nikolai didn't even try to go to the barracks, but stayed in the stables with Maxim instead. In fact, when the ox finally lay down in the straw, Nikolai crawled over to warm himself by the animal's big body. Nikolai then dropped into a sleep so deep that he never even noticed the mosquitoes swarming around him. Surprisingly, they didn't bother him much that night. Maybe it was the fact that he smelled so bad. The next morning, Nikolai felt much better. He could stand some and even walk a bit. The guard brought more food for him, a bowl of borscht and some Russian black bread. Again, Nikolai was careful about the amount that he ate, but he did manage to eat more than he had the day before. He cleaned up and then went back to work with Valdim, Vadim, though he found he couldn't lift much of anything. He didn't have any strength in his arms or legs, and he tired easily. Not surprising, Vadim looked at Nik Nikolai as if the preacher man was crazy. You must have a death wish, he chided. Whatever would possess you to put yourself through ten days of torture in the box? Nikolai tried to explain about his love for God and God's love for the human race. He tried to explain about his sacred devotion to the Sabbath, but Vadim just shook his head in disbelief and muttered to himself under his breath. By Thursday morning, Nikolai could get around pretty well, though he did have a limp in his stride. Friday arrived, and for the first time since he had been pulled from the box, Nikolai allowed himself to think about what the next morning might bring. To him, Sabbath was a very special day, whether he was in a church or a lonely prison camp. However, Sabbath also meant that he was going to have to face the warden again. What would the high-ranking officer do this time? The first time Nikolai had been severely beaten by both Yuri and the warden. <coughs> the second Sabbath, he had been locked up in a box for ten days. 
on the third time around, would they finally give up or would the persecutions continue? Nikolai wondered how much worse things could get. He was sure that there would be another confrontation with the warden and he dreaded it. But he also knew that he had to remain faithful to God no matter what. He couldn't give up now. The Sabbath was his special blessing from God. With all his heart, he wanted to honor the sacred day and the creator God who designed it. Chapter 15. The night was moving slowly into the first shades of dawn when Nikolai suddenly awoke. What it was that had awakened him, he couldn't say. It wasn't the noise of anyone else in the barracks. They were all still sleeping, though Nikolai was sure their laborious snoring could have kept him awake all night if he hadn't been so tired. It wasn't the sound of the birds. There were very few songbirds out here in the Siberian steppes. Nikolai wondered if it was his mind working overtime that had woken him with a start, and what could he expect? The ordeal through which he had been during the past two weeks had been horrible, dreadfully uncomfortable. And what about the next go-around with the warden? Nikolai feared it would be as bad as the times before, maybe worse. But he was calm, surprisingly so, and it felt strange. To be sure, he didn't relish the idea of spending more time in a box, if that's what the warden had in store for him. But for some reason, Nikolai didn't feel like he needed to escape the approaching hardship the warden might bring. In fact, he felt very little anxiety over it. So why couldn't he sleep then? Maybe he just needed more strength, the kind of strength he could only get through prayer. Nikolai slipped out of bed and onto his knees to pray to his Heavenly Father. It was wonderful to be able to call on the one who could give him help in time of need. Wonderful to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit kneeling with him on the hard dirt floor beside that narrow bunk. The longer he prayed, the more sure he was that he was going to have to suffer more. He would not be delivered from trouble. He would not be spared humiliation and pain. That's not the way it had usually worked for Nikolai, and he was okay with that right now. His faith might falter when he was tired or lonely or weak, but this morning, in the cool dawn of the Siberian summer, everything was going to be all right. All too soon, the sun rose, and the five o'clock wake-up call came from the guards. The prisoners in the barracks slowly stirred and then rolled out of bed to avoid having the guards come in and flush them out. For Nikolai, another Sabbath day had dawned, and again he found himself at attention, standing in front of the bunkhouse. Again, Yuri dismissed the men after roll call, but this time he kept his eye on Nikolai. Nikolai knew it was pointless to prolong the agony of the moment. He didn't make a move, and of course, Yuri noticed it. He came to where Nikolai was standing and stood with his big feet planted wide in front of the prisoner. Please don't tell me that you're going to refuse to work again, he demanded in exasperation. Because if it's true, I think I've probably met the dumbest man alive. Yuri continued to stare at Nikolai with something akin to awe on his face. He tried to hide it, but it remained there long enough to make them both uncomfortable. And then the guard appeared to regain his composure as he seemed to brush the feeling off. Forget it, he half shouted. Just get over to the warden's office right now. Nikolai knew Yuri was angry, and really he had a right to be. What did he know of Nikolai or his God? What did he know of the love of a creator for his children and the devotion Nikolai felt for this God who had come to die for man? All Yuri knew was that this stubborn Christian pastor was making trouble and upsetting the routine of the camp. Within seconds, Nikolai had crossed the compound and was waiting in the doorway of the warden's office. What are you doing here, Panchuk? The warden's eyes narrowed with surprise and skepticism and anger all in the same moment. But Nikolai said nothing. He just stood at attention, his eyes focused forward. What could he say? I asked you a question, preacher man. Nikolai knew he dared not wait to answer the irate warden. But how could he make the warden understand why he wanted to honor the seventh day of the week? The warden was the product of a society that taught that there was no such thing as a loving personal God. He had been working in the military for decades and was indoctrinated with the concept that the only real answer to life was military force. I can't work today, sir, Nikolai began. I can't dishonor God's holy Sabbath day. The warden's face contorted with rage. He ground his teeth together and then brought a fist down on his desk. You're impossible, Panchuk. I have never in all my days met a man with your stubborn stupidity. 
He rose to his feet and pushed Nikolai back through the open doorway. Guard, he shouted, looking down the hallway. Get this man out of my office and take him back to the box. The sound of running footsteps could be heard, and then Yuri was there, a look of disbelief on his face. Take Panchuk back to the box, Yuri. He likes it so much he wants to spend another ten days there. Yuri hung his head and then finally motioned for Nikolai to follow him to the stable. When they arrived at the box, he lifted the lid and motioned with his head for Nikolai to get in. When the lid dropped down on Nikolai and the dust had settled, the preacher man had time to think about his decision. He wasn't sorry. He had no regrets. He knew being locked in the box was going to be uncomfortable and excruciating, but he wasn't worried. For some strange reason, he felt no anxiety or fear or dread of the next ten days to come. It was all so bizarre, he couldn't explain it. Some days, he knew that he was going to feel abandoned and alone, no doubt. But right here and now, he was determined that he wouldn't lay the blame on God. It wasn't the Lord's fault that he was in this tiny prison of a box. It was the devil's fault. And the warden's, of course. Chapter 16 Nikolai knew Satan was angry with him for his faithfulness under persecution and his desire to keep the Sabbath. He was angry with Nikolai for all that he had done as a pastor to help spread the gospel. The evil one was frustrated with the way the church had been growing under Nikolai's leadership in Kiev and the surrounding towns of the Ukraine. Could anyone be surprised that Satan would do everything in his power to stop the work? It was Satan who had incited the KGB to persecute Nikolai when he lived in Kiev. Satan had sent Nikolai to the Siberian tundra as a prisoner to be isolated for a very long time, the rest of his life maybe. And now he was making life even harder for Nikolai by imprisoning him in a small box where there wasn't even room enough for him to stretch his legs. But it didn't matter. None of it mattered just now. Nikolai was sure. No, Nikolai would serve his time in the box for the sake of the gospel. How many more times he was going to have to do this was anybody's guess. He hoped this would be his last, but Nikolai knew he was only fooling himself if he really believed that. The warden was angry and offended that nothing he did and said had worked to change Nikolai's mind and make him obey orders. He despised Nikolai's stubbornness, and Nikolai was going to have to pay the price for it. However, if Nikolai was going to be stubborn about something, he wanted to be stubborn about the gospel of Jesus. He determined in his mind that he would outlast the best and the worst of what the warden could give him, and he would do it gladly. As morning turned into afternoon and afternoon into early evening, Nikolai again consoled himself by praying and quoting scripture. As the darkness of night descended upon the stable, Nikolai could feel the stiffness slowly but surely returning to his joints. He tried to keep his knees moving. He also decided to sing, to lift his spirits. He didn't have much of a singing voice, but the words of a familiar hymn came to mind. Under his wings I am safely abiding. Though the night deepens and tempests are wild. The words were unsteady at first, but then Nikolai's voice grew stronger. Still, I can trust him. I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me, and I am his child. Nikolai's voice swelled with even, uh, even fuller on the chorus line. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever? Under his wings my soul shall abide safely abide forever. The words worked like a tonic, and Nikolai realized that they were the magic he needed to keep his spirits up. In fact, all through that first night when he awoke to try and bend his stiffening knees, he would hum a few lines of the hymn, under his wings, under his wings, and then he would doze off into a surprisingly restful sleep. Of course, when he awakened the next morning, it took him some time before he could get the circulation going his legs again, all that day and the following night, he remembered his promise to himself and to God. Over and over again, he reminded himself that he was determined to be true to his beliefs. He would endure the discomfort of persecution for Jesus' sake, no matter what the price. He would manage the pain by praying and quoting scripture promises and singing hymns whenever he needed a spiritual boost. The pain grew unbearable after only two days, but Nikolai's courage remained strong. He spent his time recounting the blessings God had given him and the good memories he had of his family and church back home. The routine was the same. 
In the morning, Nikolai would watch through the cracks of the box as Oleg came to take Maxim to work for the day. At night, he would watch them return, tired after many trips to the spring, a kilometer away. Nikolai grew accustomed to the sound of the ox munching the sedge grass and his even breathing when he slept. It was a comfort to have another living creature near him, one that perhaps understood what it was like to be a prisoner against his will. One thing was different this time around. Yuri made it a habit to bring Nikolai a can of water and a chunk of Russian black bread once a day. That was it, but it was better than nothing, and Nikolai was pretty sure that the bread was being brought in secret. He had detected a note of sympathy on Yuri's part, but he was sure the guard would never admit to it. If the warden shared any of Yuri's sentiments, he hid them well. Whatever scars there were that made the warden who he was ran deep, and Nikolai felt badly for the man. About noon on the tenth day, the lid to the box opened again. Again, the fresh air and light was a shock to him, and again it was the face of the guard he saw first. Yuri held a handkerchief over his nose and mouth as he shook the, his head disgustedly. I don't understand you, preacher man, he said in a muffled tone, and I probably never will. Again, Yuri left Nikolai lying on the floor of the stable. Again, Nikolai half crawled, half clawed his way to a pile of straw in the corner. The painful relief of being able to stretch his legs was excruciating, but Nikolai understood the pain this time around. He was getting used to the feeling of the box. He was ahead of the game this time. Near dark, Oleg returned to the stable with Maxim. When he had unhitched old Maxim, the ox came into the stable of his own accord. After all, it was his home. He paused as he walked past Nikolai and sniffed the smelly creature laying in the bed of straw. Nikolai watched the ox eat his supper and lie down in the soft straw beside him. Several times Nikolai thought he might attempt to crawl back to the barracks, but every time he tried to get to his knees, he would slump back onto the straw in pain. He was just too weak to even make it to the stable door, let alone all the way back to the barracks. But it didn't matter to Nikolai. He had nothing to lose one way or the other. In fact, sleeping next to Maxim's warm body was an advantage during the cooler nights. As Nikolai dozed into a sleep of total exhaustion, he once again feebly hummed the familiar words, safely abide forever. Oh, I think we can do one more. Chapter 17. The next day, Nikolai managed to get to his feet and limp back to the barracks. He couldn't go to the mess hall to eat, but Yuri brought him some borscht and Russian black bread. Nikolai tried to thank the guard, but Yuri waved off the gesture as though he didn't want to hear it. By Wednesday afternoon, Nikolai thought he could probably work some if he didn't have to lift anything heavy or walk too much. No one was following him around to see that he worked, but he felt that it would be some kind of a statement to the warden if he could get in a few hours of work before sunset Wednesday. The week was half over, and Sabbath was looming on his weekly, on his we weekly horizon. It would come, and when it did, he had a feeling that the warden would put him back in the box. It was a battle of the wills now between him and the warden. It appeared that the warden wanted to win the standoff at all costs, and if he couldn't, he was certainly going to make it a painful experience for Nikolai. But, pain or not, Nikolai also wanted to win this war that had now become one of government force versus allegiance to God. Nikolai did work on Wednesday and then a full day on Thursday and Friday. By now, he was beginning to get some real looks from the other prisoners. Everyone knew he was completely devoted to his God, but Nikolai was sure many of them had no real idea what sitting in a wooden box for ten days at a time had to do with it. Was he a religious fanatic? A lunatic? Was he a political prisoner just trying to make a political statement? Sooner or later, Nikolai knew he was going to get an opportunity to share his story. Sooner or later, someone would be asking, and Nikolai would get a chance to tell them why he was so devoted to serving his God. But for now, the others just watched and wondered at Nikolai's vigilant faith. And when the Sabbath day arrived, things turned out exactly as Nikolai knew they would. He was put back in the box. It amazed him that the warden was sticking to this strategy of discipline. Every time he put Nikolai in the box, Nikolai was out of commission for 10 days, and then it took at least a day for him to recover and recoup his strength. That left him only two days to resume work again before being put back in the box. If the warden wanted to run an efficient camp, locking Nikolai up for such lengthy periods of time wasn't working. 
at least not if he wanted to get any work out of Nikolai. The whole thing didn't make much sense, but then the whole strategy of the Soviet government didn't make much sense to Nikolai either. Why force a person or a group of people to give up something they cherished? The whole thing was like trying to force a man to turn against his own family. But of course, the prison warden wouldn't care about that. He had no religion. He would never comprehend the strength of Nikolai's allegiance to his God and his church family. If he had, he would have never persisted in fighting against Nikolai's incredible, immovable devotion to the service of his God. And so it went as the short summer weeks turned into the chill of autumn. Frost came in August and then a, slight, a light snow in early September. While in the box, Nikolai could not afford to sleep for very long periods of time. Every few minutes he had to wake up to move his legs and arms so that he could keep the circulation going. When the frigid days of, of winter came in late October, Nikolai worried, how would he stay alive? How would he manage to stay warm, all cooped up in a small box? Nikolai wasn't sure if it really mattered anymore. If he perished, he perished. If it was time to, for him to lay down his life for Jesus, then he was at peace with such a fate. But just as resigned as he was to this possibility, he was just as sure that God had a plan for his life. Something in store for him as God's witness, though it be in a box. It was at times like this that the scriptures came to Nikolai's greatest comfort. His favorite passages were Psalm 23, 91, and 140. These wonderful chapters helped him focus on the real battle that was raging, the battle between good and evil. Yuri must have been feeling sorry for Nikolai again, because one morning when he brought the preacher his bread and water, he also brought two thick blankets. He, it had been an especially cold night, and the gesture warmed Nikolai's heart with gratefulness to Yuri and God. The blankets wouldn't keep him toasty, but they would take the edge off the cold winter nights. All the winter in camp was freezing, all the water in camp was freezing over by now. Even the barrels of water brought from the spring on a daily basis would freeze by morning. During the early days of winter, Petya, the cook, would break the thick sheet of ice at the top of each barrel in the mornings. But when the real temperatures of winter settled in and dropped to zero and below, the water froze solid in a matter of hours. Petya began having Oleg bring the barrels inside the kitchen. Because of the extreme temperature, Nikolai knew he couldn't afford to let the water get chilled. If he allowed the water to start to freeze, it would drop his body temperature even further when he drank it. From now on, he knew he would have to drink it right away when Yuri brought him a can of water. The hours of daylight were few now, and the nights longer. Nikolai's breath had puffs of steam when he breathed, and when he pulled the blanket up around his face, a crust of frost quickly gathered. How he managed to stay warm in the ice-cold temperatures, he never knew, but one thing was sure. With God, all things are possible. He was Nikolai's ever-present help in trouble, and he is our ever-present help in trouble as well. We'll see you tomorrow evening for the seventh-day ox.